<laughs> but it's been 10.14. I'm okay. going to formally uh, yeah, introduce start. Jackie Whitten, the Search Prep Foundation Vice President and our moderator for this session. Over to you, Jackie. Thank you. Um, first of all, hello, everybody. Um, I'm so pleased that you could join us uh, this morning. I'd firstly like to just acknowledge that um, I'm speaking to you from the uh, Gadigal country of the Eora Nation, and uh, I pay my respects to elders past and present and um, acknowledge that a sovereignty was never ceded. Um, my first, uh, and this panel is um, There's No Planet B. Um, we're going to talk about the um, relationship and interaction between the Communist Party of Australia and the environment movements, campaigns and issues. Um, just in terms of my own personal story, my first meeting of the, with the Communist Party of Australia was through my involvement with uh, environmental justice and Aboriginal land rights movements in the mid to late 1970s. And um, so it's with great pleasure and emotion from my perspective that I facilitate this, quest, this session. And um, we have four great speakers, um, and uh, uh, Gianni Sotel will respond uh, to, to the speakers. The four speakers are Bob Makinson, Rose Reed, John Wishart, and Jeff Evans. Um, what we'll do first of all is I'll give a um, bio about Bob. He's going to introduce a sort of historical political overview and context around struggles, uh, for struggles around the environment and the communist movement and then the uh, next three speakers will speak um, as a block. Okay, Bob Makinson is a biological scientist. His working career has been as a plant taxonomist, um, I hope I got that right, <laughs> biological collections manager, and as a conservation bot uh, botanist working on threatened species. He's been politically active since the age of 14, spent two years in the ALP, then joined the CPA in 1974 and was a member up to its dissolution. Dissolution, sorry, <laughs> dissolution. Uh, his areas of work as a party member and, subsequent, and subsequently included the student movement in the 1970s, the peace and disarmament movement in the 1980s and the Aboriginal land rights and reconciliation movement, especially from 1996 onwards. He finds it hard being a communist without a party, but makes the attempt. Good on you, Bob. <laughs> anyway, Bob will speak first, and um, then I'll introduce the next three speakers. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm speaking from Sydney. I'm on Garingai land, and I acknowledge the past and continuing traditions and owners of this land. The communist movement of the 20th century was usually associated with a vision of material progress through industrialization. The socialist mission was often seen as the completion and intended humanization of the profound changes in production and distribution that capitalism had set in train. Marxism as a philosophy and as a body of political praxis was after all the product of a cluster of the first industrialized societies. And it was taken up in that context and in other societies where the only available route to advancement and liberation involved replicating that same pattern of development. That picture of Marxism as wedded to industrialism was reinforced for both better and worse by the approach of what I'm gonna call the state socialist societies after 1917 and 1945. On the environmental front, there were some remarkable achievements of reforestation and a few cases of serious ecosystem conservation, notably in the USSR, China and Poland. But there were also environmental catastrophes equal to any of those of capitalism including the destruction of the Aral Sea, once the world's fourth largest freshwater lake, and the nuclear disasters at Chelyabinsk and Chernobyl. But in general, Marxism across the middle decades of the 20th century did not, as a body of doctrine, have much to say about the natural world. But it wasn't always that way. Marx's 1875 work, A Critique of the Gotha Program, in its very first sentence, challenged the proposition that, quote, labour is the source of all wealth and all culture. Labour, Marx responded, is not the source of all wealth. Nature is just as much the source of use values as human labor power. The operation of capitalism might have been Marx's main concern, but he saw capitalism and humanity itself as situated within a larger nature. There's a thin but distinct arc of environmental awareness in the writings of Marx and Engels from the manifesto onwards. It was most often expressed in relation to soil conservation and reforestation. 
which were key concerns in the European context of their time. And they both showed a deep concern with the flux and loss of soil nutrients on agricultural land, an ecological concept before the science of ecology even existed. They also conducted a long debate with the theories of Malthus and his followers over population growth, still of course relevant today. And they repeatedly called out the extreme degree to which capitalism had driven the general human estrangement or alienation from nature. We can hardly blame them for not getting much further than that. They did have a lot on their plate. The bigger point, however, is that from 1848 to about 1930, the Marxist movement as a whole had a marked receptivity to insights from the natural sciences and from the natural world. Materialist and historicist science was seen as complementary to the historical materialism in human affairs, which was Marxism's own greatest insight. And together they reinforced the global trend away from religion and idealism. It's easy to forget just how revolutionary historical materialism was and is and how it and the natural sciences seem to be working together to bring social change. Marxist intellectuals in those decades were expected to keep up with developments in the natural sciences and to probe them for relevance to human struggles. This included biology and its then embryonic subdiscipline of ecology. The Stalinization of the Communist parties from about 1930 onwards made that receptivity harder to sustain, except in ideologically approved areas. It never entirely went away, but the official Marxism professed by those parties became a more closed system. And for about 40 years, Communist parties did not have a huge amount to say about the environment. The tradition of environmental engagement by practicing Marxists, however, did linger. The Australian archeologist and Marxist, Via Gordon Child from the 1920s to the 1950s, integrated ecological thinking into his influential theories of human prehistory. In the early years of the USSR, Vavilov did the same in his work on the origins of crop plants and the conservation of their wild progenitor species. And Vernadsky developed the concept of the biosphere into a form that would eventually help lead to Gaian concepts today. Environmental issues did not feature in the programs of the CPA until the late 1960s, but that's not to say that communists were not involved in environmental issues long before that time. They were. Communists were active in some of the conservation campaigns of the 1930s, and many were participants in the bushwalking clubs that formed the nursery for two generations of future conservationists through the 40s and 50s, as did the Eureka Youth League. One unlikely centre of conservation action in the 1930s and 40s was Broken Hill, where the Barrier Field Naturalist Club, which still exists, played a major role in regenerating native vegetation as a measure for dust and erosion control. This was in effect uh, an environmental solution to a workers and community health problem. It was not a CPA initiative, but communists were involved. And one of the communists involved in that effort, Thistle Harris or Thistle Stead, went on to play an enormous role from 1940 right through to the 1980s in popularizing the appreciation of native plants and wildlife and the bush in general. And the party supported progressive land management reforms in the agricultural sector, but it was a circumscribed vision. The CPA's agricult uh, sorry, agrarian program of 1958 was hardly environmental by today's standards, but it did acknowledge the increasing industrialization of agriculture and the growth of structural debt in the rural sector, both of which remain strong factors driving environmental degradation on agricultural lands today. And it did acknowledge the extent of that degradation after a century of overclearing rabbits and soil erosion, it could hardly be ignored. But the programmatic conclusion was something of a cop out. That agrarian program of 1958 said, a people's government will embark on a vast program for remaking nature, which will include water conservation, reforestation, and the prevention of wind and water erosion. In other words, rather than being a focus for struggle within the political context of the day, these aims were reframed by that Congress off into the never never, no doubt in the name of making the program a more inspirational vision for socialism. One senses a lost opportunity for practical struggle and you can almost hear the country delegates at the 1958 Congress swearing and beating their heads on the table. And yet within five years, many CPA members, like so many others across the world, were profoundly influenced by Rachel Carson's 1962 book, Silent Spring. Within five more years, in the ferment around the Vietnam War, we see environmental value systems emerging that drew upon older left-wing critiques of the abuse of technology under militarized capitalism, and before long extended them to militarized state socialism as well, and refracted the result resulting synthesis back into the Communist Party. Five years more to the early 1970s, 
and we see the struggle to save Fraser Island from sand mining merging with the Queensland civil liberty struggle, the Tasmanian dams issue combining conservation and energy policy, green bands in the urban environment, and the beginnings of a definitive intersection of the environmental, anti-nuclear and peace movements, which was to flower spectacularly in the middle 1980s. All of these were issues in which the CPA played a significant and sometimes crucial role. So notwithstanding its blinkers in the middle of the century, the CPA had retained enough imagination and flexibility to respond remarkably quickly to these insights and developments, which were often of external origin. And by 1976, the CPA was well set on a course of merging ecological and socialist thinking. And other speakers are going to address that period. Great. Thank you, Bob. That was great to get that very broad overview of, of, the, uh, of the progress of, of environmental thinking within the communist movement. Um, I just meant to mention to the participants that you can type in comments and questions in the chat and we'll try and address those as much as possible um, after the speakers have finished. So please do use that chat facility to um, put questions and comments in. So thank you. Um, now we have 102 participants on the online, so that's fantastic. So we're going to start now with the, uh, with the three other speakers. And first of all, we'll be joined by Rose Reed, and I'll give you all of the biographies um, uh, at this point. Rose Reed was late joining the CPA, but quickly absorbed and thrived on the political analysis and expertise which she found there. Rose was involved in community activism in the Latrobe Valley, uh, Victoria, on planning energy and women's employment. She was involved in the Conservation Council of Victoria, now Environment Victoria, for a decade. And her last paid job was with the Northern Alliance for Greenhouse Action, working with local governments on climate action. She is active in the Victorian Greens, holding numerous roles, including as state convener. Thank you. And then John Wishart will speak. John joined the CPA in 1975 and remained a party member until 1991, mainly living in Adelaide. He has been a union delegate and organiser with the FEDFA and the ASU and the AEU. He has been involved in a number of environmental campaigns, including against wood chip export in Tasmania and in opposition to uranium mining and export. He has argued consistently against the false choice between jobs and environmental sustainability. John is currently the state convener of the South Australian Greens. Jeff Evans was inspired to join the CPA in the 1970s through his involvement in the anti-nuclear movement in Sydney. He has since campaigned and organised at the intersection of environment, Indigenous, human rights and economic justice issues, particularly on mining energy, just transitions and climate justice. Jeff was the first president of Climate Action Network Australia. He is a writer, gardener, and crown grandfather. He currently manages a bunch of community development, housing, and arts programs with an Aboriginal organisation in Warramungu country in Central Australia, where he's settling in for the next four months of 40 degree plus temperatures. Good luck, Jeff. <laughs> okay, Rose, would you like to start? Thanks, Jackie, and hi, everybody. Um, I'm here on Boonarung country in Melbourne's uh, southeast, and I pay my respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging. Uh, my focus today is on um, two CPA members who, one of whom I got to know um, quite well, because as I said, as Jackie said, I was a very late comer to the party. But I really wanted to focus on um, the pioneering work of uh, Ruth and Murray Crow, and it's, uh, in my view, still uh, really leading work on looking at uh, our cities, the urban form, issues around energy, transport, and creating green and livable cities, um, highly pertinent today. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the Sydney cider, Jack Mundy, about whom a great deal has been um, written and many tributes for his uh, extraordinary work uh, in, uh, as an urban activist and trade unionist. And it's usually uh, we see that uh, the party's connections to the trade union movement has been very, very strong. And uh, by flipping it uh, down to Melbourne and focusing in on the Crows uh, and their work in the 60s and 70s, uh, 
I really just wanted to say there's another side to the story as well. I think they really did create a vision for a sustainable city, as I said, highly relevant uh, to the debates that are going on to, in this climate changed world. Uh, against the dangers of urban sprawl, of freeways, of loss of connected community. So I really want to focus on, I guess, two things. Uh, one was their ideas and vision, and uh, the second was their organising and the capacity to build bridges. So back in the, uh, the late 60s, uh, there were plans for uh, humongous uh, development uh, linked by freeways for Melbourne. And uh, the Crows were very much behind plans for Melbourne, parts one, two, and three in the late 60s. And it emerged from, I guess, what we call today as uh, a think tank, uh, a number of people coming together, debating, working through issues, and arriving at, um, at an alternative plan for Melbourne from that was that was being proposed by um, the government and the planning authorities. And all of their work uh, demonstrated that their thinking was that people and the environment could not be disconnected. And uh, I have a kind of little excerpt from Leonie Sandico, who's at the University of Melbourne and one of their urban planners who regarded the plainly titled plan for Melbourne was an astonishing document. It was a critique of the existing planning system and its official plan, which wanted to knock down half the inner city, base the future of metropolitan area on the motor car, and provide Melbourne with 300 miles of freeways. The plan for Melbourne was a fully formed vision of an alternative city based on the privileging of neighbourhoods and the communities that they nourished. They later went on uh, to develop further work called uh, Seeds for Change, which was published by the Conservation Council of Victoria eventually. And in that work and further work with the idea of cities being developed through a cluster and connect system, they proposed an ur urban fabric, which comprised of the clusters of uh, dense uh, residential, mixed use so that you can live, work and play in the one area connected by public transport and which was highly um, conserving of energy. Now these alternatives uh, well predate the climate crisis, but they were grounded in the energy crisis in the 70s and I think today still remain absolutely leading thinking. The other aspect of their work, and it's one that I um, have very fond memories of um, Ruth, knowing Ruth in her uh, later years as uh, an extraordinary networker and bridge builder. And I think this is a, an epitome of many of the um, party activists. She was a meticulous organiser uh, for including absolutely everyone. everyone if she organised an event, everybody had a role and there was a role for everybody no matter what, how, how big or how small. Um, and she absolutely made sure everybody uh, was on board. And fundamental to that was a bigger picture about the importance of everybody having uh, a say and being part of uh, democratising city design planning and developing their own communities. This was sort of seminal to um, the community organising and community development work um, through, the, through the 70s, which I think still has uh, very strong uh, resonances today. Uh, but I do want to highlight, and, uh, and maybe John a bit later might contest this, but um, in looking through the documentations, uh, I think part of their organising style was the four-day Radical Ecology Conference attended by more than 500 people held in Melbourne in 1975, which attracted um, such a variety of participants, including the Australian Conservation Foundation, Conservation Council of Victoria, people from Nimbin and other new lifestyle um, communities, 
as well as trade unionists, including those active on the Green Vans campaign, municipal councillors and members of urban action and community organisations. And it was radical not only in the issues discussed, but in the networking and non-hierarchical way it was organised before, during and after the conference. And issues such as the relationship between urban sprawl, the use of non-renewable energy were discussed. And uh, all of those things uh, were happening in a recognition that we live in Australia in one of the most urbanised and suburbanised um, countries in the world. And from that conference spawned the movement for uranium mining and the community energy network, um, which I connected with when I was member of the Conservation Council um, during the 90s. I think those influence of connections and ideas um, continually uh, lives on and uh, were probably uh, demonstrated the sort of praxis and um, of uh, communist activists out in community um, extraordinarily. Uh, and anybody who's interested in um, delving into some of those periods of history, uh, the Crows and Ruth in particular left a remarkable collection, the Crow collection in the Victoria University Library. And you can still um, access that online easily today. And there are rabbit holes there that are real, really worth um, going down. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Rose. I'm just seeing if Jackie might uh, come back on before I perhaps step in uh, while there's a bit of technical difficulty. Maybe ASIO has done their worst to eliminate our moderator at this point. Uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> our, our next speaker is uh, John Wishart, who has a, uh, an incredible uh, record of activism in the environment movement. Um, I don't have it right in front of me. I know John's bio uh, about his current activism as the co-convener of the Greens in South Australia, but um, I will throw to, to John and uh, maybe we'll do a reverse biography once you're finished, John. Thanks, Luke. Um, and thanks, Rose and Bob, for um, your contributions, which are really interesting. Um, I'm speaking from Ghana land um, in Adelaide, and I pay my respects to elders past and present, and sovereignty was never, never ceded. Um, Jackie asked me to um, talk about the question of um, what did I learn from my involvement in the CPA as an environment activist? And um, I suppose the short answer is a lot. Um, but I want to pick out three things. First of all, the importance of an alternative economic and social program. Secondly, <clears throat> the need for a coalition of the left. And thirdly, how to be an activist. And I'm going to take a few examples um, from my time largely in South Australia and Tasmania. Um, I first came to uh, the party out of the anti-war and uh, movement um, conscription. <clears throat> and also um, a growing awareness about the need for uh, anti-capitalist uh, society and uh, an ecologically sustainable one. A lot of people know about the Green Band, so I won't deal with that. But that was, before I joined the party, that was one of my introductions, if you like, to the potential for the link between the environment movement and the workers' movement. Um, in Tasmania... Um, the party's presence is less well known. It was small in Tasmania, but there were big campaigns in the 70s and the 80s uh, around the uh, opposition to the sacrifice of native forests for wood chip exports. And of course, to the destructive dam building, which came to a peak with the Franklin Dam dispute. Uh, the party was active in all those campaigns and it showed me the importance of a pathway beyond opposition because um, the party stressed alternative economic development, which was environmentally sustainable. And uh, Rose has talked about the fantastic work of uh, Ruth and Maury Crow, which I think was probably really outstanding. But in a smaller way, people like Max Bound, who was a, a very prominent uh, party member in Tasmania, um, some trade union leaders, 
um, and some researchers set up the Trade Union Community Research Centre. And they were putting forward a different vision for Tasmania, um, economically and socially. And one of the things they published in 1984 was Tasmania, a way to go, which was in distinction to um, the conservative developments that were around them. In South Australia, um, there were big protest movements arising around uranium mining and export in the 70s and 80s, as there were right around the country. And the CPA was very active in various facets of this, from street rallies to blockades at Honeymoon and Roxby, and to lobbying local councils to declare um, themselves to be nuclear-free zones. Um, and, um, but also it was important that there was a stress on renewable energy. Um, and one of the organisations that was involved in this was uh, Environmentalists for Full Employment. Chas Martin, a party member, combined with Bob Giles, a former secretary of the Plumbers Union, and they published uh, a booklet called Jobs, Energy and Environmental Harmony Towards a Sustainable Economy for South Australia. That was in 1981. These are examples, again, of not just linking unions in environment movement, but proposing um, alternative programs. So really, this is a subset of um, what the CPA's broader strategic outlook was. That is that if we were to transform the society as opposed to just calling for the end of capitalism, we needed to articulate alternative economic and social programs which were capable of winning support from a broad cross section of people. Uh, my second lesson, I suppose, or one lesson I'd like to draw to is the need for a coalition of the left. Whether it was in the environment movement or in other movements, the party stressed that a coalition of progressive forces was essential if we were to achieve significant change. As younger comrades, we were taught about the lessons of the communist movement in Australia and overseas, how it was often communist uniting with other progressives that achieved breakthroughs. And by the time I joined the CPA, the party didn't see itself as a vanguard party. We weren't always right. We didn't have all the answers and we had to learn from others. And I think this set us apart from the more doctrine, doctrine, uh, sorry, doctrinal communist tendencies who are almost always ineffective in the mass movements. Um, thirdly, how to be an activist. Um, partly by example, partly through more formal educational sessions, new younger people coming into the CPA were taught how to be effective activists. That's one reason why people stuck with the party. They learned how to be politically effective and this was rewarding. A fair amount of stress was put on being reliable, well-organized and disciplined. Also to be observant, to pay attention to what people did and did and to look for people who could be drawn further into organizing work or leadership. It seems obvious, but it was people, not just ideas that were important. This applied to our own work in the union movement and the social movements. To conclude, I'd like to make two very brief comments about what did the environment activists give to the CPA? And Bob uh, and, and Rose have already hinted at or talked about some of these. Even in the 70s and 80s, not all party members saw the importance of the ecological perspective. There were some still who saw class struggle as primary. And those of us who could clearly see the great threats posed by rampant industrialism and consumerism had to educate others in the party that environmental issues were not second order issues. We had to argue for environmental sustainability to be fully incorporated into our policies. It was the same for women in the party who worked to overcome sexism or for party members from a non-Anglo or Celtic background who needed to educate others about the depth of racism in Australian society and what sort of measures were needed to minimise discrimination against non-English speaking communities. But here is one of the great strengths of the CPA. It brought people together committed from different movements. We learnt from each other and we were broader and more effective because of this. Next. Oh, thank you, John. And um, I apologise for my dropout. The internet in inner city in Sydney is appalling. Um, anyway, and I don't know if John's bio was read with, prior to you speaking, John. Is that was it? I, I no. confess I didn't. I'm sorry. About okay, that. that's okay. No, well, just to to um, recap on that. 
John joined the CPA in 1975 and remained a party member until 1991, mainly living in Adelaide. He's been, oh, sorry, I did, uh, he has been an organiser with the FEDFA and the ASU and the AEU. He's been involved in a number of environmental campaigns, including against wood chip in um, export in Tasmania and in opposition to uranium mining and export. He's argued consistently against the false choice between jobs and environmental state sustainability. John is currently the state convener of the South Australian Greens. And I'd just like to say, am I on at the moment? Yeah, okay. Um, I'd just like to say that the uh, speakers have been asked to talk about the ways in which their involvement with the CPA influenced their activism in environmental justice movements, and also how that environmental justice um, activism influenced the CPA. So thank you very much for that. Um, the next speaker is Jeff Evans. Um, Jeff was inspired to join the CPA in the 1970s through his involvement in um, the CPA, uh, sorry, through his involvement in the anti-nuclear movement in Sydney. Um, I think that um, I've read this actually prior to the, all the speakers speaking, sorry, my internet outage has thrown me a bit. So Jeff, um, please give, give us your um, contribution now. <laughs> Hello, comrades. Um, I'm speaking to you from Tennant Creek in Central Australia in the Red Centre. Uh, I like to think of it as red in more than one way, uh, both the natural environment, but also uh, the contribution that communists and others have made to politics in this part of the world. Um, just to let you know, this is a desert country that I'm speaking to you from. It's Waramungu country. Waramungu people are very proud that they managed to turn John McDowell Stewart back from Attack Creek all the way back to Adelaide uh, in his first attempt to cross the continent. And uh, they are a very um, strong uh, community of people uh, who've lived in the desert here for tens of thousands of years. And um, this painting behind me is actually done by a local artist, uh, Clifford Thompson, and it's called A Dry Creek Waiting for Rain, which is exactly what it's like here at the moment. We're looking forward to uh, 40 degree temperatures, up to 50 degree temperatures for the next um, four months at least. Um, and one of the topics that I'll talk about in my talk is the issue of climate justice. Uh, but really my talk regarding the CPA, I wanna talk a little bit about before I joined the CPA, while I was in the CPA and, and how it's contributed to my politics since I left the CPA or since the CPA disbanded. Um, so the, the four things that I really wanna focus on is, the concept of uh, revolution or fundamental social change versus reform, which I think it was a fundamental difference and is a, between the CPA and other political organisations and parties. The fact that the personal is political, which is something that I learned before the CPA, but was emphasised while I was in the party. Um, the idea of challenging power and exploitation in many different locations and building alliances across many different social movements to drive change. And finally, uh, and the courage to be different and to stand your ground um, in a difficult world and often in uh, very hostile social and political environments. So I joined this um, CPA after having uh, been a student in Canberra studying environmental science where I, uh, my first political engagements were on issues that uh, around the anti-war, the tent embassy, anti-apartheid struggles, and then uh, into the environment movement through Friends of the Earth, where we've established a Friends of the Earth group in Canberra. And um, Friends of the Earth is one of those environment groups which also sees the close connection between the social, economic, and in ecological uh, domains of society. They're not just a, you might say a tree hugger, or naturalist focused environment group, not that that's not important, but they did see the connection between changing society in order to change uh, human relationships between nature and people and between people and other people as fundamental to achieving 
uh, a sustainable future. And I think that idea of um, changing relationships between people and nature fundamentally is really important now as we move in towards the you know 21st century where you know global species collapse and climate collapse is really happening all around us and we have a very short window of opportunity really to fundamentally change society um, so that's one of the things i learned from being involved in friends of the earth which was emphasized by my involvement in the radical ecology conference that um, ruth referred to where I came across communist activists like Jack Mundy and Maureen and Ruth Crow that, and, uh, who had a big influence on me and I guess helped set my trajectory as a uh, environmental activist. I moved to Sydney uh, mid seventies and uh, working with Friends of the Earth as their national liaison officer, actually hosted uh, in some times by Tom Uren in his office uh, as an ally of um, the environment movement who gave us access to resources that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to afford, such as a phone and a photocopier. Um, and, um, and through that uh, involvement in the anti-nuclear movement, I again came across uh, uh, communists, people like Brian Ahrens. Uh, one of the things that really influenced my decision to move towards the Communist Party as a political support and uh, learning place was the in, inevitably I would find that the activists who would open up um, new opportunities for the anti-nuclear movement to grow were communists. People like Brian Dunnett and others at Chalora Railway Workshops. Some of the uh, people like Hal Alexander and other nurses working at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Um, teachers, people in uh, local community areas like Evelyn Armstrong in the Liverpool area and Don and um, Syme and his family in the Liverpool area that would open up the opportunities for these movements like the anti-nuclear movement to spread out into workplaces and into communities. And I didn't even know at the time that these people were communists, but I would find out afterwards and I think, wow, this is just amazing that this political network uh, was able to uh, educate me, but also help me build uh, an effective movement as one of the organisers of the Sydney movement against uranium mining. The other uh, influence I felt at that time from communists was um, the way the party worked within social movements. It had, in contrast to some of the other uh, leftist parties or cliques or cults or whatever we'd like to think of them as, uh, the Communist Party activists had a strong commitment to working in a democratic, transparent and creative way. Um, tried to have movements uh, like the anti-nuclear movement open to all people and give everybody a voice in the movement. It wasn't like a series of people just getting up and re regurgitating the same party line one after the other and actually using social movements to build their own organisation. They actually had a genuine commitment to uh, build the social movement and to drive change in that way and to establish links, not just organisationally, but theoretically and practically between movements, particularly uh, between the environment movement, the women's movement, uh, Aboriginal movement and the trade union movement. So that was really important for me. And in fact, what prompted me to eventually join the party was uh, my involvement in the White Bay blockade of the uranium shipments coming through Sydney to be exported out of the port of Sydney and the uh, police brutality that led to a lot of people being badly hurt at that protest. And as a result of that, the communist leaders of the Sydney Waterside workers invited me to speak at a mass meeting of Sydney Waterside workers at the Sydney Town Hall. Um, and I remember being briefed about how I might approach doing that as a sort of young greenie um, without decent um, pairs of shoes or uh, decent clothes. And I remember sitting in a room with, at this Dixon Street before I joined the party with Joe Palmada, Brian Ahrens and the Sydney Wharfies 
who were the leaders, John Healy and Ricky Divers, I think it was. And they said, first of all, we've got to get you some decent clothes. So they got me a Paisley shirt, which I think was borrowed from Brian and a pair of shoes and, and then said, listen, if you're going to talk to these wharfies, this is the way to, to do it. And as a result of that meeting, I'm not saying it's because of me, but Sydney Wharfies put a ban on exports of uranium through the port of Sydney, linked up with similar positions taken by the Darwin Wharfies, led by another communist, Brian Manning, and railway workers and others, that then led to the ACTU putting a ban on uranium mines, new mines, and that held the line to, at the three mines policy uh, for the Labor Party for a generation. So I thought, you know, with that sort of support and understanding, that was when I joined the Communist Party. I moved um, from the cent Sydney to Central Australia uh, in the early 80s to work in Tennant Creek uh, with my partner, um, who's a school teacher. And um, the other issues I learned there is the courage to be different. I moved from Bondo Beach where, uh, to Tennant Creek. Uh, one thing about being in the city is you still have to be brave to defend your politics, but when, particularly when you end up in a small town in the middle of the continent, uh, within a day we had been declared as having gone over to the black side because we befriended Aboriginal people and uh, were working with them on a bunch of issues around education, health, wellbeing, and housing, but also in the environmental space around the uh, wish of the Northern Territory government at the time to create a toxic chemical waste incinerator in Tennant Creek. The same mentality that led to the nuclear waste, uh, nuclear um, bomb testing in Maralinga was out of sight, out of mind. This is the environmental justice issue where the people who least cause the problem are often the ones who are most exposed and most vulnerable to the most toxic and dangerous elements of capitalist society. So in our case here in Tennant Creek, it was about becoming a uh, site for a toxic chemical waste incinerator. Again, we reached out to the Darwin Wharfies. They supported us. We built a campaign that built national networks. So we managed to stop that toxic waste incinerator. We did a similar thing later in the, uh, around a nuclear waste dump proposal in Tennant Creek. And now we have the same issue around fracking uh, for gas in, in Central Australia. So again, we're building those alliances. We're trying to put pressure where the decisions are being made uh, to interrupt business as usual. And um, so I think that sort of issue also relates to climate justice um, now, where, as I said, the temperatures are getting higher, it's becoming less livable in places like Central Australia. So. I think that's the legacy of the Communist Party. It's not like the, the, our legacy died when the party disbanded. It continues and it continues to inform future generations of activists. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And um, thank you to all the speakers. And it, I think it really showed how, you know, the influence of working with um, the CPA has, you know, multiple effects, multiplier effects. And as Jeff said, it continues today and we look forward to how we continue to work and build on the foundations of um, how we have learned to work within um, a political movement. And I think that um, there's 109 participants, so it's great. So any questions are welcome, please. There's a couple that have come in, but uh, Gianni is now going to speak to us. So tell, um, I'll just give you his uh, a brief bio. Um, <coughs> Gianni is an environment and union activist in Brisbane. After growing up in a CPA household, he refounded the UQ Environment Collective in 2011 and has been the Queensland convener of the Labor Environment Action Network since 2015. In this role, Gianni led and won a campaign to build publicly owned renewables and won a $740 million investment in renewables in Queensland. Gianni is also a union organiser and activist and has been a member of SEARCH since 2017. So thank you. Welcome. No, thank you. And um, thank you everyone who's spoken so far. I just want to, I'll start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on. I'm on the land of the Yugura people in Brisbane South. Um, uh, and I guess um, 
probably what I'd like to say, I guess, in response to what the, the, the really interesting and um, excellent speakers that have come so far is, I guess, reflecting on some of, uh, I, I guess, the, the question when I first saw the question, how has the CPA informed your environment activism? I didn't necessarily know the answer to that. Um, because as a, you know, as a, as a youngish person, um, I have been never lived, never was a member of the CPA because it dissolved when I was born. Um, and um, what I, I've always thought a lot of the environment, uh, my, so my mother is actually, was a long-term CPA member up in Brisbane. She worked for the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Um, when I was a child, she uh, did a bunch of work um, and campaigning uh, in the local area that I grew up in, running campaigns for better public transport to, you know, make sure that schools are properly resourced. Like, you know, she got like, three school halls built, like at my primary school, she took over the PNC and then um, <laughs> organized to take over the PNC with community members, made them build a hall, made them um, uh, do a bunch of like increased uh, access to public transport. And um, and then after they got, got sort of Shanghai doing it again at our, at our high school. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I thought was just sort of her, um, I actually kind of think may actually be communist party stuff. Um, so I guess um, growing up with, a, like, with that experience, growing up hearing stories of my parents, um, uh, you know, sort of collecting money and on the picket line supporting striking workers in the Seaquip dispute, which probably many of you know about and um, may have been involved in. Um, I actually, uh, I think that a lot of those the lessons around bringing people together, finding out who people are at and building genuine cross, uh, cross community and cross organizational alliances is actually uh, like CPA tactics that I didn't, <laughs> that I didn't realize. So um, that's actually been very educational and very helpful. So I really appreciate um, what everyone said so far. I guess, um, I guess Luke uh, sort of spoke to me a bit about where the, about to talk about where things are going next for the environment movement. Um, and I guess um, and what the sort of priorities are. I think um, it's been really informative. It, they're sort of not that different from what they have been in the past, I think, um, which is on one hand, slightly discouraging, but on the other hand, I mean, it means we can learn from history. Um, I think, um, my, my experience of uh, environmental activism is that it works best when um, you can bring together uh, the interests of workers and the interests of protecting the climate, um, much like Jeff was talking about sort of in, in, with people in his community and sort of other people have discussed. Um, uh, I think um, we've like, there has been a, a, a push in um, Queensland's kind of, and, and I, and I I understand that I'm at the risk of sounding a bit provincial here, but um, Queensland is uh, at the center of the coal culture war. Um, there is a real serious problem that um, working class people think that um, in a lot of regional areas think that their prosperity is tied to coal and other fossil fuels. Um, and that's a genuine thing that they think. Um, and that's something that has to be challenged. But I guess um, the way that there's sort of been two approaches to it, right? There's been the approach, which is try to sort of club them over the head win elections in Melbourne and Sydney, and then sort of bring it, put an end to things like the Adani Mine Project, rather than generally going to those areas, talking to those people and, and sort of figuring out how to tie together their improvements of their lives and the, and the improvements of the material conditions of the working class with um, serious and genuine action on climate change, which I think probably is the most urgent um, issue that is facing us. Um, and here in Queensland, what, what what I did in my role as a union organizer um, at the at, a, at an energy union, so it's um, uh, we we did sort of the indoor workers in the electricity industry. Um, we came together with the ETU and other environment groups, AYCC, ACF, um, Queensland Conservation Council, um, Solar Citizens, other groups, um, and we actually have been campaigning for year uh, for almost a year over a year on the building of public renewables um, because. And the import, them being public is very important because it obviously, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit sort of old school social democrat. But like in in Queensland, public public sector job, public sector infrastructure means good jobs in the region. So it means the improvement of the lives of those people in those communities, and actual, uh, as well as you know, actually reducing the demand for coal, reducing the demand for, um, and sort of like replacing those coal power stations, and also a real just transition for those people as well, because it means that there are jobs in that same place for those people being forced to move. Somewhere else, you know, and I mean, I think uh, some of the like people in, if you work in a coal mine on $120,000 a year, you do not want to move to Cairns and work as a, sort of an attendant at a tourism facility for $40,000 a year. That's not really a great, that's not a great pitch, right? Um, so uh, 
we've we got together we actually organized in those regional areas we had um actions in towns or actions in cans there were um i think um uh i think fifteen thousand people signed a petition and a pledge in support of renewal of that stuff we got um we got um some of the marginal seat mps in townsville who are like um you know not the most left-wing politicians but they're people that actually are in areas where uh, elections are decided um to commit to that thing and as a result of that we've actually got this massive investment in it and uh, it has become it's actually become um we thought it would become a wedge issue between the liberals and labor but the liberals have actually said they support it as well which is quite funny um i don't think they actually do but the apologies have become so much that they've actually resisted they, they are forced therefore to do it sort of stuff so i guess um i think the priority of i think i think that the priority of um the environment needs to be sort of learning from the from the practices and and sort of behavior and tactics of the of, of the cpa and the way that they sort of brought it together um and and moving next to um sort of doing that seriously in in on the issue of climate change actually going to those people who are directly affected obviously you know both the regional working class but also like first nations people and building like a, a unified push so there's actually clear majorities in support of climate action rather than trying to um take a sort of oppositional frame because as i think previous speaker said there, there is not very much time and and we have to get everyone support to be able to make a change i think that's probably slightly shorter than i was supposed to say but i was thinking short a short panel is a good panel so <laughs> Thanks, Kiana. That's great. And it's great to see the sort of action that's going on now and the way that, you know, you're taking up um, that, that sort of linking and enabling work. And I think that's uh, drawing, that's pointing to a question. There's been a, a few comments, um, mostly to say how good it, it has been to hear these um, contributions and how interesting it is. But there's a question about, you know, continuing, um, how does the work that the CPA began in terms of enabling and linking organisations. Is that something that the Search Foundation is looking forward to doing? That's one question that's come in from Carmen Blanco, and um, I could throw that open in uh, in a minute. Um, the other thing is that there's been a um, comment about the Eureka Bush, the Camp Eureka, um, by Mari Goonan. She contributed how the um, U Camp Eureka has been. Uh, developed um, through funding from the Search Foundation, but also through the you know incredible work of the uh, Working Collective that formed in 1981. And the Camp Eureka is in Victoria. It's uh, listed as a heritage site, and um, it's a site that um, is being regenerated and revegetated to a high level. So that's great work, Mari. Thanks very much. And someone else. Um, also uh, wanted to mention the Camp Eureka regeneration and Rose, you may know about that. Um, you may want to talk about that. So there's two issues whether you would like to comment on the role of search as a sort of continuing that work of linking and enabling and also um, Rose or anyone else might want to say something about Camp Eureka. So thank you. So I'll throw it open to the panel to look at the role of search. Jackie, could I come in on that first one? Oh. Not a search. Um, I think it's a good question from Fiona. Um, it's. I, I think it is a really important thing that we uh, can offer and we can develop further. Uh, that is to say, a meeting place where people can come together from different movements, uh, irrespective of their party affiliations or the particular movement they're involved in, and learn from each other. And um, there's probably a lot more we could do at studying you know, the sort of stuff that's the subject of the webinars today. So I do think it's a really useful um, thing for search to be doing, um, and but not just in a backward way, but looking forward. Um, mm. And for example, the, the perspectives that Gianna was uh, raising about the need to go beyond just opposition. Again, it's the same thing. You need to provide an alternative. Uh, you need to connect with um, people at the grassroots with workers' concerns, community concerns, and provide them with um, a real alternative to an unsustainable development path. So I'm very supportive of that for search, doing more of that. Great. Thanks, John. Would anyone else like to comment on that? No, okay. Um, um, yeah, Jackie, I'll just say that I think there is an opportunity 
you know, for search to continue to reach out. Um, I mean, we're probably not at the centre of things quite so much as search as even the CPA was, but there's so many other organisations out there doing really good community organising, community education work that we can partner with um, in the environment movement, in the union movement, uh, and in every other social movement. And I think search is starting to do that. And the other big opportunity for search, which I think was also a strength of the Communist Party, which I didn't talk much about, is the international solidarity and um, it was taking a global perspective, uh, linking a global perspective with the local perspective. And some of the work that Search has done, for example, um, in Timor-Leste and other places is really important. And not just, uh, you know, like the environment and development and social justice and human rights, they're all linked up as one thing. They're not separate silos. And I think that is a really important insight that Search can continue to give. Right. Thank you. And um, just in terms of that linking, and th th there will be a panel on international solidarity later today. But also, um, Bob Bowden has just put in a question about whether some, like any of our Greens comrades, would like to comment on um, the contradiction that was raised in the previous section around the um, tensions and um, position taken by the Greens in terms of the Uluru statement. I mean, that's a big question and we've only got a few minutes, but possibly um, if, if uh, Rose or John would like to comment on that. And um, we've also got a question about the initiative of the AMWU and LEAN to form the Hunter Jobs Alliance. Jeff, you might know a bit about that as well. So there's a two, two biggish questions to fill up the last couple of minutes. Rose, would you like Jackie, to? I'm not going. I don't necessarily want to um, engage on the debate around the Uluru statement. Um, my kind of superficial assessment is that it's a debate about tactics uh, rather than um, any fundamental one. But I think there's a, a clearly a discussion that needs to be had. But I don't want to leave um, Camp Eureka yeah. <laughs> or the role of search um, because I actually got more involved in CPA things post um, the demise of the CPA. And there was um, a, a, an education program for young activists that um, called Inspire Activism that ran um, a number of sessions. And I think there's a continuing thirst uh, for uh, that online activist or in person that can draw through and draw from the kinds of, I'm struck by the commonality of things that we've shared in terms of what was uh, typically um, fabulous organising uh, with uh, a political, uh, a very clear political purpose. Um, but I did want to just mention um, that not only was, is Camp Eureka kind of alive and well, it's in lockdown, it's one of the places I've been dreaming to go to. Mm. Uh, it is a remarkable place. And it, it is, I, I guess, a living legacy of um, environmental and uh, social connections. So, you know, one steps into what are the you know, it's steeped in the history of the Eureka Youth League uh, and you can't avoid that, but it also uh, works collectively and in such a strong spirit of um, sharing what the co contemporary uh, issues and concerns are. So it becomes a bit of a, a, a hotbed of debate and discussion about what's happening in, the, in our communities and in, in the broader world. So, yeah. It lives on again, the Communist Party. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Um, is there any final contributions, John? Gianni? Jeff, Bob? Bob, you haven't are you I might just can I just quickly say um, the work that MW and Lean are doing um, in the Hunter, um, it is extremely exciting. But I will say, and this is I said before I was at risk of single provincial, it is copying the stuff that the Queensland lean did with the ETU um, over the last few years. However, it doesn't mean it's not any not as good or anything else like that. But it is, I mean, I think, yeah, this is essentially that at the end of the day, um, you, you can't win things. You can't, uh, it's not 
you're not a socialist uh, if you want to make workers change what they're doing without consulting them, without working with them, without working with their organizations. So any, any effective climate action to win um, and to be effective and to win serious social support must have majorities. So you need mass organizations like unions. So I think it's, a, it's an incredibly important and effective model that people should copy. Thank you. That sounds like a positive note to end on. I'm sorry to cut it short because there's many things we could talk about and there's been a couple of questions that I haven't been able to get to. So hopefully we'll be able to follow this up with um, more work for us in search to, to take up the, the banner or, or the baton of um, moving this forward and to draw on the politics of the past, present and future. So thank you very much, everybody. It's been a great session. 113 people. <laughs> well done, well done, well done, all our panelists. Thank you very, very much for uh, all your contributions. As brilliant. I can say that we will, we're in planning a session on the Hunter Jobs Alliance, uh, perhaps with uh, Steve Murphy, who's coming on for the next panel, and Felicity Wade, who are uh, big movers in it. And uh, good news, Rose Jani has been uh, one of the organisers of our uh, education uh, program stuff in Queensland. We're doing it around the country a little bit affected by COVID, but it is happening. Um, so but I want to thank most of all Jackie uh, for being such a great moderator. Great talk by Bob and uh, of course, John, Rose, Jeff and Jane. We're getting lots of messages. People are um, sending through congratulations and uh, saying much, uh, what a great session that was. So thank you very, very much. Great, thank you. Now, in between this uh, session uh, that I'm about to moderate on uh, the class struggle, we're going to hear from special guest Ronald Briggs, who is a uh, librarian, Indigenous services and curator here at the library. Uh, we're going to share some photos on the screen, rare photos from the Tribune collection here held by the State Library. So I'm going to first introduce Ronald. Hello, hello everyone. Thanks for being with us. And uh, now I'm going to go to the share screen function and Ronald's going to take us through some of these very, very cool photos. Hopefully everyone can see what's happening there now. Sure, so these are some photographs from the um, Tribune uh, photo negative collection that we've been digitizing or the State Library has been digitizing over the last few years. Um, I've gone through and, 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 and pulled out some of the ones, some of the more extraordinary ones, I think that, uh, that do document um, indigenous peoples, um, Aboriginal peoples um, activism and um, and, and struggle for rights in, in New South Wales, particularly in New South Wales. Our Tribune was based in New South Wales and Sydney. Uh, so the first picture we have up here is of, um, uh, of Chika Dixon, world famous Aboriginal activist, Chika Dixon. He was uh, very prominent with the uh, Waterside Workers Union, um, an organiser with them, uh, but also a, a fierce campaigner for Aboriginal rights. Here he is speaking at Sydney University in 1972. Um, inspired by the Black Panther movement um, that was happening in the States, the, um, the Aboriginal people were becoming more, wanting to become more militant in their, in their, in their dealings with um, uh, governments and, and officials. The next pick is at the same rally, um, same day, that's uh, a very young Gary Foley, um, who, was, um, who, came, who, who still is a prominent activist and, and campaigner for Aboriginal rights in Australia, now living in Melbourne. Um, this is around the same time that he was getting involved with the, the Aboriginal Tent Embassy as well in Canberra. Um, so that's a, a lovely pic of the young Gary Foley there. Uh, the next... The captions. Oh, yeah. Sorry, these are all on the library's Flickr set. So if you go to the website called Flickr um, you'll, and type in State Library of New South Wales, you'll, you'll be able to look at these yourself at another time if you want to go back and, 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 and have another look at them. And next. we'll send around and the link and put it on the search Facebook as well. Mm. Uh, this is um, Pastor Frank Roberts. Uh, you, you may be familiar with Rhoda Roberts, uh, who who's works in the arts now, but used to be a presenter with SPS. This is her dad speaking at the uh, Aboriginal, a big rally at the Aboriginal Tent Embassy, I think the date's 1974. It, but it, in Flickr, if you scroll down, you actually get a description of what the, and more information about the image, image itself. And what we've been able to do also is to link it to the actual article, uh, digitised article that, uh, that the photograph appeared in, um, in the Tribune newspaper. So you can read more information about that particular event or person. This is Harry Hall. Uh, now the Freedom Rides are well known for going out to Moree and, and, and other places in Western New, South, Western New South Wales. 
and the North Coast. Uh, but Harry Hall was a camp was a, uh, a leader in the Walgut community, and uh, the Freedom Rides returned to Walgut uh, to get um, the the local um, uh, movie theatre desegregated because Aboriginal people had to sit in a separate part of the of the theatre away from the whites. Uh, so the, the Freedom Riders went back to assist Harry and his community uh, desegregate that particular movie theatre in 1965. Now this is topical because this is um, Kath Walker, uh, who became known as Ujuru Nunaku. She's the uh, famous uh, Australian poet and author and activist in, in, in her earlier years. Here she is at a meeting in Sydney uh, in 1970, because in 1970, the, the, the 200th anniversary of Cook's arrival in Australia was being celebrated. So Bukatsi, who, who, who uh, Kath or Ujuru was with, um, declared that day um, an invasion day, basically, so at that meeting, and got lots of publicity with Bakatsi for it. Uh, there was a huge protest that, that happened a little bit later in, in the year. This is um, John Newfong. He was um, a, a head of Bakatsi with the Federal Council of Corruption Torture Islanders um, uh, in 1970. Here he is speaking um, at that at a rally that was being held before um, a big protest that happened out at um, Botany Bay. Um, so that's John Newfong. He was actually uh, Australia's first uh, mainstream Indigenous journalist uh, from Queensland originally. This is a young Paul Coe speaking at that same meeting at Sydney Town Hall. Paul Coe went on to become uh, a lawyer and, 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 a, and a judge. Um, as a young man, we're actually there. This is Joe McGuinness, who was uh, actually the head of Fakatsi, the, the Federal Council for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And he was actually the, the, the person in charge when the 1967 referendum happened. So this is the, a year later when he visited Sydney. And this, it actually says in the article that he was visiting the CPA offices at the time. So this photograph was taken at CPA headquarters. That's cool. Hmm. Uh, Dexter Daniels, um, he was uh, uh, an organiser with the North Australian Workers' Union. Uh, he, he was paid to visit Sydney and speak at a few events in, in, the, in the late 60s. And here he is speaking at a, um, at a union meeting. Dexter Daniels. Again, uh, Chica Dixon. This is, Chica actually worked with the, what was called the Foundation for Aboriginal Affairs on George Street. Um, that was actually run by Charlie Perkins. He was good mates with Charlie Perkins. And this photograph is taken at the Foundation for Aboriginal Affairs. This is Mick Langiardi, who was um, a Gurindji man from, from North Australia. They were actually protesting at the time um, for better wages, um, particularly at a place called Wave Hill Station. Uh, which was owned by Vestie, so it was this huge case and, and still resonates today. Fat Lord Vestie. Mm -hmm. Now these three young activists, I guess. <laughs> um, I know that the, the gentleman on the left um, is um, is Billy Craigie, uh, a fellow from Maury, and the fellow on the right is Gary Williams, um, yep. who's still around and, and again is still a prominent activist. And I'm not sure who the gentleman in the middle is, but they were actually, um, when the Springbok, um, South Australian Springboks toured in 1971, wasn't it? Um, uh, there was a huge protest, huge, massive protest whenever they um, were playing. And he, these, these three guys are actually wearing Springbok jerseys. Where they got them, we don't know, but there was an article, the attached article suggests that they might've been stolen. From the hotel, <laughs> liberated, <laughs> liberated, liberated, from, liberated from, is from the, the term hotel. we use. So that's a, that's, <laughs> that's just a, a small series of photos showing it. Just um, most of them would have been taken by uh, the photographer Noel Hazard, I would imagine. Um, often in the Tribune, photographers were attributed, but Noel was pretty active within the um, Aboriginal rights campaign movements that happened from the 60s up to the um, late 70s. That's brilliant. And so they are now all up on the uh, on Flickr. That's you can see if you're looking at this, the screen right now uh, in my tart, my uh, uh, browser bar there, mm -hmm. uh, and State Library of New South Wales. You can check it out. We'll put the link in the on the uh, search yeah. Facebook, and uh, you know if you need to lose it, 
just get in contact. Yeah, more than 30,000 photographs from the Tribune um, uh, photo negative archive have been digitized, uh, uh, dating in range from the early 60s up to um, early 90s. So the final ones are in color. That's <laughs> brilliant. Nice to see. And uh, many of the people on this uh, uh, Zoom call have contributed to the digitization of that. So we want to thank all the people who've um, donated and we can still donate now uh, at the Search Foundation website to contribute to our half of the costs of uh, digitising uh, Tribune right up until 1991. It's pretty, what we understand is pretty close to being fully done now. So uh, uh, thank you for everyone. No, who's, thank you. And it so, is fully done. We've just got the news now. It's just come through. <laughs> thank you so much. And, and, and Search has been so uh, cooperative and supportive with this. So it's a really great <coughs> project to work on together. And while I've still got you here, Ron, I want to thank you for your uh, help in setting up today's no, uh, no, whole, no, no. The whole day today. No, so well, brilliant having you. <laughs> well, the Communist Party records are here uh, in the library. If, you, in, if you're curious about why we're co-sponsoring this event, um, the, the CPA records and photographs are kept in the State Library of New South Wales. Come and do some research on them, especially all our young comrades and older comrades. So thank you very much, Ron. Thank you.